Welcome to a video on fluoridation. My name is Floyd Maxwell. My website is justthinkit.com and I am a chemical engineer. Graduated uh, in 1984 from the University of British Columbia, chemical engineering. And I want to talk to you about fluoride from a strictly chemical or chemical engineering perspective. There are many people that weighed in on this issue. It's very controversial. The sides are polarized, sort of like in, you know, Republican versus Democrat. So my thinking is to give you something a little different, another perspective, another fresh perspective. So what is fluoride? Chemical element. Here's the periodic table. 100, 120 odd elements. Fluoride is here in yellow. It's off of the yellow column. These are the halogens. The reactivity and the sort of the properties of chemical elements are determined by the column they're the vertical column they're in typically. You get some also some other groupings here. These green groupings and purple groupings are obviously similar compounds. The red are similar. The, these ones on the far right, the orange, we won't be talking about too much because they are inert. They don't tend to react. Why don't they react? Their electron orbitals or outer orbitals are full, just right, stable. The other compounds are reactive because they are either have an excess electron or they need an electron. On the far left we have the alkali metals and they have one extra electron. It's not stable like that. And so they have one to give. They have a foul to give to use the MBA term. So hydrogen has one extra electron. It only has one but still it's extra. It's orbital. It would rather have two. So when hydrogen reacts it combines one of its electrons sharing it with someone else and they share one with hydrogen and both parties are happy. Same with the ones below it. Even though they're in red they are similar to hydrogen in that way. If you go to these sort of, I don't know, gray purple column here starting with Be Beryllium, they have two to share and when they share it with someone else you get a stable situation. Over here on the yellow column, the halogens, they have almost a full set. They are missing one electron and they're pretty hungry about it. So on the far right and far left, not counting this orange here, which is stable, the yellow and the red, let's simplify it, are reactive. They are the most reactive because they're the most sort of off balance, basically. And so we have fluorine wanting electron. We have something on the far left having one to give. So very commonly, you get compounds on the left combining with compounds in this yellow column here. So you might have sodium here and chlorine there. You might have potassium and chlorine. Potassium chloride, sodium chloride, those are salts in our body. They're common stuff. Here's HCl, hydrochloric acid, HCl. Again, a pretty common thing. Uh, you also can get calcium chloride. They now use calcium chlorides on the road. Supposedly it's better, less corrosive. This whole controversy about fluoridation is, should you add fluoride to the water or not? The supposed benefit is that fluoride does something good for your teeth. Well, the truth is that fluoride does something to your teeth, absolutely. It modifies it, it changes the uh, mineral structure of your tooth, which is good and bad. It makes your teeth more brittle, for example. But a basic principle of uh, metals, of metallurgy, is that, you know, when you have a metal and say you heat up a metal and then you quench it rapidly, it becomes brittle, but it's also harder. So that's what you get with fluoride and your teeth. If you want harder, more brittle teeth, then put fluoride on it personally. I don't want that because nature didn't do that. Animals don't do that. It's just stupid, arrogant humans who do it, frankly. Their teeth are fine just the way they are. Of course, the big problem with uh, teeth is nothing to do with fluoride. It's nothing even really to do with, you know, brushing. It's to do with sugar. And it's to do with having a, a large amount of contact of sugar and sugar-like compounds on your teeth for large amounts of the day. You know, drinking a soda all day long and you'll have bad teeth. So it has acid that weakens the teeth, it has sugar that encourages the bacteria to grow in your teeth, the bacteria create more acid, your teeth dissolve. Your teeth will dissolve in acid. Don't drink acid, don't leave acid on your teeth. That's the real cure to the supposed dental problem. So they're adding fluoride to teeth, to, well yeah, to teeth, to water and you're drinking it, supposedly to help your teeth. Some of it will get to your teeth. If you were to drink it through a straw that missed your teeth entirely, it would get into your body, and some of it would probably trickle towards your teeth. But most of it would not. In other words, if you really are so high on the idea of putting fluoride on your teeth as a way to help your teeth, put it on toothpaste. That goes directly on your teeth. 
And by the way, if fluoride is a poison, you want to be careful how you get that off your teeth so that you don't swallow it. And you sure as heck don't want kids swallowing big bu bunches of it, do you? That's why there's a warning on that toothpaste tube. But let me ask you, how many kids do you know that are so meticulous in their brushing that they don't swallow some of the fluoride? Forget it. We're all swallowing it. And even if we weren't swallowing it, we're absorbing it in our mouth. So we're having side effects already. Uh, from fluoride, not even counting drinking it. Of course, when you drink it, another very bad aspect of fluoride from our body's perspective kicks in, and that is that the fluoride molecule has a molecular weight, fluorine has a molecular weight of 18. Oxygen 16, hydrogen 1, H2O, 2 H's, that would be 2, plus 1O, which is 16, you get a total of 18. So H2O has the same molecular weight as fluorine. What does that mean? Chemistry, when all else being equal, the size of the molecule determines, well, among other things, its reactivity. So here we have fluorine is the smallest in this group. Uh, all else being equal, they all have uh, a need for one electron, but everything else being equal, fluorine is the most reactive. Smaller equals more reactive. Chlorine is next most reactive, bromine less, and of course iodine is so unreactive that you can, you know, it is something that we accept and we do consume it and we do need it in our diet. And it regulates our thyroid and it is, you know, legitimate. But these other things, as you get up this direction, even just to chlorine, chlorine is controversial. Chlorine is a poison. Chlorine gas, World War II, it's just bad stuff. And it's bleach. When you drink chlorinated water, you're drinking bleach. The next step up from chlorinated water is chloramine water, which is like a little nastier. And then you get to the big one, fluoridated water. So fluorine is the most reactive thing in the whole periodic table. What does that mean? It means that, well, in com combination with the fact that it's the same size as water, it dissolves in water, it means that wherever water goes in your body, this reactive stuff is going in your body. Now, fluorine occurs in nature. That's one of the arguments. Well, it's natural. Yeah, well, arsenic is natural. Lead, PV, lead is natural. Aluminum is natural. But we know that aluminum has bad properties. We sure as heck know that lead has bad properties and arsenic. So this whole sort of, you know, natural in quotes thing, that doesn't cut it. That doesn't cut it at all. That's meaningless. You have to understand what's going on and you have to t get to the facts, not the, the sort of the theory, you know, bad theory at that. I'm getting worked up here. So fluoride in the water, wherever the water goes, the fluorine goes. Fluorine is very reactive, the most, considered the most reactive element, or let's just say one of the most doesn't really matter. It's very reactive. We'll scroll down here to where it talks about free radicals. There have been a lot of concern like dioxins. Uh, it was related to free radicals. Basically dioxins, everyone found out were really nasty. When you burn something, you get partial burning products. products. Those are dioxins and they're really bad. Why? They're free radicals. Smoking, what's so bad about smoking? Free radicals. Stuff in the smoke that wants to react. Well, you don't have to smoke to get something bad in your body. Just put some fluorine in there and you've got something that's radical, truly. Fluorine ion in solution is a radical. By definition, it is a free radical. When you drink it, you're drinking a free radical, and it's a very reactive free radical. It can do what it wants, and it does. One of the reasons that fluorine is used so much in so many different fields is because of its reactivity. It's, it's the reactive ele element in sarin gas, nerve gas. Sarin is one of the you know, really nasty nerve gases. It makes mustard gas look like you know something a little bit more mild. And fluorine is doing the nasty work on that one. There's a lot of uh, medical chemicals that have fluorine as the active ingredient. They're not good chemicals. We're not talking you know stuff that makes you better. We're talking stuff that masks symptoms and is supposedly recommended for you. But really, when you investigate it, it's bad news. When you go under the knife, when you um, get general anesthetic, that general anesthetic these days usually is a fluorine active compound. In other words, the fluorine is the most uh, is the reason this compound is working and knocking you out, taking control of you. Frankly, you know, yes, we do need to have operations, but wouldn't it, you know, from my perspective, it would be nice if we had a general anesthetic that didn't involve fluorine. So speaking of that. Yeah, fluorine is all over the place. It's in, you know, I think it's Prozac, it's in anesthetics. They're and now adding it as a fungicide. They don't have to list it on the ingredients. This stuff is getting really prevalent in the environment. The problem is it reacts with our body. In other words, stays in our body. Our kidneys are a filter, like a mesh. Fluorine is the size of water. Kidneys don't filter out water. They filter out part and a key part. Well, that means they filter out part of the fluorine and keep the rest of the fluorine, about 50%, just like the water. And 
we've got a problem of accumulation of this stuff and it causes fluorosis. Look up, just go into Google, click on images, and type in fluorosis. F L U O R fluor O S I S fluorosis. Google will help you with the spelling. You'll see some really horrific pictures. This is what happens when you get too much fluoride. Check it out, man. <laughs> this is a really, really nasty subject. This isn't think of the children. That is the big lie. And speaking of big lies, you know, this all this wonder drug fluoride, one of the wonder drugs of the 20th century, that's what you'll hear people saying sometimes, especially on, you know, mass media. Fluoridation started in the 50s. And they're just so proud of it. You know, oh, wow. It's a lie. That lie started in the 50s. It's no different than asbestos, really, in terms of we start off thinking it's good, or for that matter, lead and gasoline. You start adding lead, tetraethyl lead to gasoline. Oh, wow, we get better octane. Hey, that, you know, in principle, good idea. Getting more octane, getting more bang for your buck, literally, great idea. Oh, whoops, we're putting lead into the environment, then we're breathing it, and then it's getting on our plants, etc. That's a bad idea. In fact, if you research about lead and violence, there was a new article recently about that, saying that violence has decreased in the last few decades. Pretty much, they figure exactly because of getting lead out of the gasoline. Well, it's time to get the lead out of our water. The lead in this case being fluoride, although when they, <laughs> the type of material they actually put in your water supply when they fluoridate it does contain lead. Why? Because it's a toxic waste product. Product of the fertilizer and uh, aluminum smeltering industries that they, companies used to have to pay money to get rid of this toxic product, big bucks to get rid of it, and now they can sell it because it's good for you, and they put it in your water. This is a big conspiracy. It's on a big level, and people who try and speak out about it are ostracized, fired, etc. And then sort of average Joe nobodies like myself, when we speak out about it, they say, well, you're not scientific, and uh, blah, 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 you know, whack jobs and conspiracy. Well, hey, it's a conspiracy. I'm comfortable saying that. Conspiracy says one or more people working together to do something. Hey, one or more people are definitely working on it, so the only thing left to resolve is, is it good or not? If it's not good, it's a conspiracy. That's it. Well, this is a huge conspiracy. This is the conspiracy of our times. That's why on my website, this is a page called, you know, No Fluoride and No F. I've shortened it to say that, but I have other pages. I have an international anti-fluoridation database. You are probably in there, like your town, your community, your county, your water supply, your country. It'll be mentioned here somewhere, most likely. If not, send me an email. Let me know. I'll be happy to add it. Uh, there's all kinds of different actions you can take. You can lobby. You can avoid it. That's what I recommend. I think reverse osmosis is ineffective because basically it works the same way as your kidneys. I am, was personally not convinced of distillation when I tried it, but maybe it's just a matter of your equipment. Um, it seems, because if you look at it, water boils at 212. I just use HF as an example. Hydrofluoric acid boils at basically the same temperature range. So unless your equipment maybe can be fine-tuned a little bit, uh, I think you, you will evaporate the water, you'll evaporate the fluoride, and then they'll both condense and you've got the problem again. Don't trust your water. Look into it. Contact your water supply. If you're stuck in a fluoridated area, you can sign your bill under protest. You can put that right on your bill. So every time they start getting checks from people saying, hey, we're protesting this, we're not accepting this. And for sure, don't trust the so-called experts. There are very few. Paul Connett, C-O-N-N-E-T-T, good one. There's not that many. There's a fluoride poisoning list on Yahoo groups. I recommend that. Some experts there. Hound the water bottling companies. What I mean there is, with a lot of these stupid companies, they don't tell you if they're where they get their water from and how well it's filtered. If it's not filtered properly or if it's drawing from a source that has high, high natural fluoride, then you're still drinking fluoride. Bug them and get their analysis of the water. So that's the quick rundown. Really, you know, you can summarize fluoride chemically. I'll, I'll time myself. I'll try and summarize it in, uh, in one minute. Here we go. Chemically, fluoride is a poison. It's more toxic than lead, almost as toxic as arsenic. It is the same size as the water molecule, so wherever the water goes, the fluoride goes. It's supposedly good for teeth, but in reality, it hardens and makes more brittle teeth. It does the same for bones, giving you fluorosis, very bad news. It is biologically very active, so the range of side effects is probably, probably sets a record 
for side effects from one compound. It's a conspiracy, no two ways about it. If it's any good, put it on your toothpaste. In my case, I don't put it on my toothpaste. I don't drink it. I don't shower in it. I don't recommend you do. That's all in 45 seconds. So this is Floyd Maxwell on fluoride.